Let's start now. I want to sort of make it a little bit more entertaining. And uh, to do that, I should walk a little So, first one is really enjoyable. Try to soak into the video, right? That will put your mood right. Because you all are coming after work and you all are not busy people and you know your minds are not focused. So let's play with this. Let's watch this video. Did you enjoy? What can you tell about that video? I want a few comments of, from you all. What did you? Why did I play, play that? Any idea? How many people are there? Oh, you had to interact, right? There are only five people. <laughs> at least, you all, if you all don't interact, you know, that's the fun. Seven. Seven. Good, at least. You all are right. When I ask this question, a lot of people say six. Right? What would have happened if that guy was seated there? All by himself. What would have happened? No entertainment, right? So, one by one, people started coming and contributed to the entertainment. And finally, we got a, I mean, you saw the chair, right? So, it's just like engineering. We think, as engineers, I can do everything by myself, right? It's a total myth. Engineering is a teamwork, right? You need everyone to contribute. Sometimes you saw that uh, casual guy, he didn't play an instrument, he didn't carry an instrument, he also contributed, right? So there are some people who we even neglect that we want these kind of people in our day to day work, right? So that I thought will just sort of put your minds at ease and sort of focus on engineering. So before I start anything, I want to share with you some of my favorite videos, some quotes and anecdotes. My first quote is coming from a book gifted to me by a gentleman called Arup Roy Chowdhury. He was the CEO of National Thermal Power Corporation of India. Now, National Thermal Power Corporation of India is a huge organization spread across India and in charge of most of the thermal power generation in the country, mostly coal and also a few other oil fired uh, generators. Right? So, he has the credit of being the youngest CEO at the age of 32, uh, heading uh, not this NTPC, but prior to that, the public corporation of India having more than 300,000 people under him. You can just imagine, at that age he started, and I went and met him, he was have been in his late uh, 50s, or early 50s, sorry, early 50s. And, uh, <coughs> He was the CEO of NTPC and I was the CEO of CEB and when we met there, we were carrying on this uh, joint studies on the Sampur project which was just about to commence. And uh, so the last visit I went uh, to see him, uh, that was in 2014, he gifted this book fresh from the press and the title of the book is Management by Idiots, just Google it and see, if you can get a copy, please get a copy and See, it's very interesting, a completely non-traditional way of addressing uh, management, the kind of book on management, right? Management by idiots. And uh, he gives this first paragraph, first chapter itself, he gives this very strong message. If you don't blow your own trumpet, that's why I showed, uh, so, thought of showing you those trumpets. You know the amount of racket that a trumpet can create, right? Trumpets and saxophones can create a lot of, lot of. Uh, I mean, you didn't feel that there was no other instrument. Only the air instrument, then uh, trumpets and saxophones. You saw the shape of that, right? He says, if you don't blow your own trumpet, others will use it as a spittoon. You know what a spittoon is? In single, we call it padikkava. In Tamil, we call it padikkava. Right? 
and now those padikkams are not at all seen in the homes but when we were small there was a padikkam always when our old people used to spit on and you know so we people used to clean it every day and still some place in, of course in temples you see this right so remember if you don't blow your own trumpet others will use it as spit now it doesn't mean to say like a empty vessel you just say something no 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 that's not what i mean your talk sense in fact there are i used to do two lectures and towards the end i used to have another lecture on uh, how to make sense when you talk and write so if the isl wants me to do that i can do that uh, how to make you understandable when you write and talk is very important and here i am not just telling that you have to just talk uh, empty words if you know something and if you have to say that at any point of time in your workplace you got to say that if you don't do that you will go home and start wondering oh why the hell did i t- tell that at that meeting time is gone decisions are made at the nick of the time if you want to say something you got to say that as an engineer right not like old teachers so this is the <clears throat> what you saw in the cartoon in the same book if you don't blow your own trumpet others will use it as spit on of course there are small story that's behind it i heard it when i was in america for a short time uh, when i met a very famous uh, ambassador of a country in america he was in fact tipped to be the secretary general of the united states i will not mention the name he is a really really witty person witty person and when he went you know actually i should tell you is uh, none other than uh, i forget his name now he just came to my and went to wait it's a it is a matter uh he invited us for dinner at his ambassador's house and there was a big photograph of bill clinton and our ambassador playing the trumpet they have been uh, in campus together had a very illustrious uh, can you recall the person it just came to my mind and went on uh right so he said he said i mean he is a witty guy you know after dinner you know you just have a chat with them and you have uh, be a brandy or something so you when you are talking he said uh, that's small story i want to tell you but because he saw the him playing the trumpet with bill clinton big photograph and he said uh, you know there's a nice story i'll want to share with you one day we were invited to uh, the white house for dinner and there was a sri lankan minister you know the ministers come in and say oh i mean that's not this right okay that's no 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 bad feeling about that he said you know uh, so i took him along and you know it was in the garden and we had uh, cocktails and after a few drinks he said the minister was highly a bit high and uh, before that bill clinton has started playing the trumpet and uh, you know there's a nice stand if you can look at the google you also see the nice stand it's made out of wood where you can stand this uh, uh, just the the opening up just like the what you saw there uh, standing on the corner so after playing you know you put it on there the stand so after a couple of drinks our minister want to go to the loop he was right for a small job he was looking around he suddenly saw this and gone and done the need food right of course it's a joke it's a bloody joke i know that right but that's how he keeps the crowd going so uh, so much worse things can happen if you don't speak up i would say the present day crisis the engineers have not spoken enough we don't you think the engineers are at the bottom of the development of this country we need doctors we need lawyers we need all that other professionals i am not saying no i am not belittling their roles if not for the engineers where are the roads where are the tanks where are the dams where are the uh, highways where are all those things railroads how can the buses run without engineers how can trains run without the engineers so in fact we are the backbone of this country have we done our job properly have we spoken what is right and what is wrong 
So let's at least now with a firm resolve that we will not stay quiet. I'm not trying to go to say Aragal. I never been there. Actually, I didn't go there. I knew from the day one that it's not going to the going to visit law like that. Now, it was a good thing. I'm not saying bad. At least people galvanized and now people are very much aware of the politics and things like that. And people don't have fear to talk against the politics. That's the main thing. Right? Of course, I knew it's not, it was not going to be successful. It's not because of that I didn't go. I mean, I don't want to go and uh, I don't, I'm not a, that kind of person, you know. But I speak up. You can check with anybody. I speak up when time comes. So I don't want to keep quiet and go home and drop me to kaka. I think most of it, most of, most of the time it has happened, it has happened to you also, also. So never regret. If you have to say something, please say so at the correct time. Don't regret after that. And uh, in a very old Hindu scripture, you find this, these are, these are called Vedanta scripts, scriptures. There are, I think, a couple of Hindus here, right? Yeah. <coughs> so Vedanta, I mean, early the recordings show that some of these scriptures are about 4,000 to 6,000 years old. And the latest I saw was, they can even go up to about 12,000 years backward. Written scriptures, huh? And some of them are written on the clay tablets. So, the oldest religion, I think. So, this is come the, from the Rig Veda. I think it's a very famous uh, book, Rig Veda. has a lot of good things. When there's harmony between the mind, Mind is associated with the brain, right? Heart is associated with the feelings. Mind, uh, rational, feelings, and the character, resolution, your firm conviction that you're going to do it. You are resolved to doing something. Then nothing is impossible. Nothing is impossible. Now, I, I firmly believe this. Yeah, I'm going to show that I believe in it. Now, it doesn't mean to say that, I mean, you can now think, okay, tomorrow I'm going to be in moon, on the moon. Only a madman coming from <laughs> Angkor will think like that. You, on, on your, I mean, reasonable mind, you, you can't think about that. So, you'll never think about like that. So, your mind will not allow you to think of irrational things. It will only allow you to think of rational things. If your mind, heart, that means you are emotionally attached to that. Your passion is there to do something. Heart and resolution. Resolution means you are firmly convicted, convinced that you are going to do it. And you have confidence in you that you can do it. I shall do it, I can, I can do it. Then nothing is impossible. Please, my dear friends, only five or six of you are there. I firmly believe in this. I have achieved this in my life. I told you I am going to blow my own trumpet. Nothing is impossible. I do believe in this. If you don't believe in this, let's watch these two videos. I am not sure whether you have seen these things before. So you got to believe that you can do it, right? I was 65 years old when I did that. Okay? His colleagues will bear witness to this. Right. So there's nothing called impossible. Mind, heart, and resolution. And that's the kind of engineers we want in this country. Let's watch the last video of Lee Kuan Yew. I'm not sure whether. I am sure you, there are a lot of video clips going around now, even now, about Lee Kuan Yew. Right? What do you think of this guy? Very inspirational. Very inspirational. Anything else? What about his character? Yeah, true, leader. true leader. Inspirational. What else? What else? What else? There are so many things he said, right? A lot of leads to his life. What else? 
Okay, let's go ahead. So Singapore incidentally was thrown out of Malayan Kingdom unexpectedly in 1965. They were part of Malayan, uh, Malaysia. They were just thrown out overnight. Why? Because Malaysia thought Singapore was a burden. It was just a fishing village, fishing harbour. And he said it was a swamp. In his own words, he calls it Singapore as a swamp. Madhavagura, like Uttarajira. Right? So, in his own words, Singapore was a swamp. Singapore was full of gangsters. He said he had few millions of people to account for. What can you learn from this man? If this is the person who is supposed to have said in 1965, I will make Singapore like Ceylon. Right? I would say he was a man of immense courage who never looked back on his mission. Firm of his conviction, resolve, stay focused, want to achieve something with no matter what, stayed away from all those who did not fall in line with the commitment to rebuild the nation. It's very important that, you know, if you, I think in Buddhism you have this very famous stanza, right? Do you call that? Uh, if I'm, 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 I'm not a Buddhist. What do you call that? What do you call that? What do you call that? What is the stanza? Asayonach bala nam padjira pandita nancha sayona. Right. That says it all. Don't associate with the guys who will pull you from your legs. Just ignore them. Carry on your task. Did not serve everyone with the same spoon. He was very much criticized by his own colleagues for doing this. It's also saying that if you try to please everyone, you will end up pleasing no one. As leaders, as engineers, as managers, you cannot please everyone. You have to take a stand and you have to carry out your mission, right? No matter what. Decision making is the cornerstone in engineering. If you are indecisive, please resolve that you are going to be a decision maker. We want that kind of people in this country, no one else. So what will happen if you try to treat everyone with the equal measure, equal spoon? You often hear people say, sorry for this uh, word, fonts, it says, Mama Hamotam Vidan Nekama Hande. Mama Hamotam Vidan Nekama Hande. I've heard it, no? I serve everyone with the same spoon. Is it a bad thing? Is it a bad thing? What is this? Anavarakkum Ore Kandial. Kandial is the spoon, right? Sevai Sekire. And I, I'm sure it's correct, right? I got it with it several times. Three jars. Same spoon. You try to serve. What happens? For the corner man, what you are trying to serve will be too much. He can't gather what you are saying. He can't get everything that you want him to do. He has limited capability. So identify the people with whom you are working. For the middle, middle man, it's just right. Adequate work. And for the this corner man, however much work that you give him. A single katadi yaka. In fact, I had an engineer when I was doing Abagat Pole, everybody used to call him Vadeyaka. Vadeyaka, Vadeyaka. Right? You have heard about the story, right? There are certain devils who can't be appeased. <laughs> They'll give him if they more and more work. There are people with whom you are working, you have to keep them occupied all the time. If they don't do that, they get frustrated. If you also, on the other hand, try to push someone else who can't do, uh, who don't have the capability to do everything, he'll also get frustrated. Or he'll be, un un I mean, he will feel that he's 
he cannot cope up. So don't try to treat everyone with the same spoon. You have to discriminate some, no, when I say discriminate is not the word, you have to be, be smart enough to understand the capabilities of various people. I have heard many people coming and telling me, Sir, so I tell them, I value you most. I know that you are capable of doing this. Then they get motivated to do some, some more. Right, there are a lot, of, lot to learn from people of the caliber of Lee Kuan Yew. So the last quote perhaps, one of my very favorite quotes. I am thankful for all those who said no to me. If because of them, I am doing it myself. So one of my favorite quotes, which I, in fact, used it in my career of 36 plus years. To date, I think I am passed out about 1978. How many years? 40 plus years, right? 40, uh, 45 years of public life. I don't know how many of you have heard about this project called Upper Kotpuli Hydro Power Project. Anyone here? In fact, uh, on 16th of September, I did a lecture here on the Vimal Surayanza Memory Commercial Lecture. You can, uh, it's in, available in the YouTube. Please just have a look at it. You will learn a lot from this project. I am only telling you a few things. It is a 150 megawatt project. Uh, the last one commission, the last commission high to power project that was in 2012. The capital cost was 40 billion rupees, but 400 million dollars at that time. Started in 1992, the studies stalled several times, several times on environmental, socio and political grounds. How many of you have heard about this project? No one. You have heard about it. You know how much pressure there was not to do the project. Just like the Sampur project that was shelved. Right? It, everybody thought it would not be able to, I will not be able to do it. I was the project director. I was associated with this project from 1992 onwards continuously until the project was commissioned in 2012. That's 20 years. 20 years of my career of 36 years in CB. And I thought that was not the only one I did, right? While doing all the other things, I was constantly behind this project. How many of you have that resolve to do it? I'm challenging you. I'm blowing my own trumpet. Finally, it was commenced in 2006 and completed 2012. Why did I do Upper Kotpuri Hydro Power Project? And how did I do it? My guiding light was a quotation from the Bible. If you know what is right to do and not doing is a sin. I'm sure in Buddhism also there is a lot of uh, stanzas on that kind of thing. Every religion has this. So being good, you know, I say no lies, hear no lies, and say no, that's not going to work, you know. That's not going to take good nirvana. Okay? If you know what is right to do, you must do it. I knew doing Apagatpali was the right thing to do, and I did not want to be a sinner. So I kept on doing it. No matter what. There are several threats to my life. Still I did it. So I did it notwithstanding any obstacle, any impediment. No one believed that I will do it with so much opposition. In fact, when I got the loan somewhere in 2002, I got the loan in 2002, we could not start the project in 2002. Then the political thing started. Thondaman started fighting with this project. Right? The invitations were sent by Actually, at that time, the minister was Karu Jayasuri to commence the project on the 25th of May 2000, uh, 2002. Just a couple of days before. You know who is in power now? He gives a call to Karu Jayasuri. He was there in Kasari with me, making all the arrangements to start the project on the on 25th of May. 
he brought a lame excuse and said, there's an election coming, the present Pradesh of some of the postman. Did he get ten of the answer, Pradesh of, I don't know what the Pradesh of is. Elections are going to come, so hold on. The word was hold on. How long did we hold on? Four years. This is how the politicians can bungle the projects. We got the money, 2002. Until 2006, we could not start the project. Right? All because of one man. And he is in power now. I am not talking about politics here. Everybody is the same. All politicians are the same. Except I have a lot of respect for Haruja as well. He kept on behind me. He was there on the day of that we were to open the thing. And on the, in the morning he went, but he told me to go to the side and play some sentries and cut the sword. So we did that. But he is a, he is a real, real, he was revolting against the, his own leader. You want to show that though you asked me not to do it, I got it done. Of course, it did happen. That's a different matter. So I did it with notwithstanding any obstacle, any impediment, no one believed that I will do it with so much of opposition. Some even wish that I fail. I thank them all. How did I do it? Because everyone said I will not do it. I took it as a challenge to do it. I stayed focused and was not swayed by the noise around. I had about uh, 14 engineers working with me at that time and I had an office going, project was going and every now and then there were news reports that the cabinet has stopped the project. So every day in the morning the engineers used to come to my office and say, Sir, Apita Mukha what's going to happen to us? I said, we are going to do it. Out of that 14, 13 engineers stayed with me until I started the project. Four years. Four years. We did not listen to the noise around. There were many decisions of the cabinet to do it and not to do it. To do it and not to do it. The last decision says rescind all the previous decisions to do it. And of course there was a small catch. Now you made use of the catch. I did not take the decision of the cabinet to rescind all the previous decisions. I used the there was a positive one positive word. I used the positive word and carried on the project. And I was proven right. I ignored it. I'm still surviving. I had faith in God. I knew that it was the right thing to do. The person who wrote the cabinet decision to rescind the project was the same person later on who continuously supported me throughout the project. A couple of years later. I thank my staff at Apagot Palais who had faith only in me. Now I turn to engineering. What is engineering? Who is an engineer? What do you expect to do as an engineer? You are like mature people, you know, you have all the answers, I know that. Are you prepared to face the challenges of engineering education? You have already gone through that. Gain experience, you have already got that. And you are just on the threshold of becoming a fully qualified professional engineer. That's why you are here. So let me tell you a small story. I don't know how many of you have heard this. There's a band by the name Herbert Clark Hoover. So he was a young man, and this young man was uh, on a steamer. Those days, steamers, the steamships, you should uh, take people and cargo around the sea, across the seas. So he was going from traveling from London to New York in a first class cabin. And along with him in the first class cabin was a young lady, and he befriended, so they had chat. It was about two or three months to cross the Atlantic. And today maybe about five or six days. 
every one week. Right? So at that final day, they were sitting for the breakfast. And this is a true story, right? It was written in his own diary. And uh, they were sitting and they saw the New York Harbor. And they were sitting for the last breakfast. And after the breakfast, this lady had an urgent question to ask. What is the question? What is the question he would have asked? She would have asked. Anybody? No guess. Come on. No guess. What is the question she would have asked? Young man. First class cabin, right? Okay. Only first class people are in first class cabins. He, she asked, what is your profession? And he was American, right? She was a Britisher. And he said, I'm an engineer. You think every, the moment of that, you know, the, the lady would have grabbed her and he would have given a kiss? Just the contrary. Her face fell. She was so upset. She got annoyed. In fact, annoyed with this guy. Why the hell did I so this guy for three months? He was an engineer. And the face of the lady fell. And she snapped back and said, I thought you were a gentleman. I thought you were a gentleman. So those days, engineers were not considered as gentlemen. That's why he, she was surprised that this guy was traveling in a first class cabin. Only gentlemen traveling in the first class cabin. Right? So those days, engineers were smelling. Can't get anyone here an engineer. Full of sweat, grease and grime and everything. They're smelling people. Who overalls, had dirty hands, karagat, rough, tough, often spoken filth. You may not believe this, right? I'm going to tell you a story. Had very bad mannerisms, therefore not recognized in society. When I joined the CEB in 1979, we had engineers in CEB who had bastam in his hand. Bastam? Walking sticks. Why do you think you had that walking stick? Just because they could walk? They are very fit people. Why? Anybody? Why did they have basta in, in, in their hands? And they were wearing shorts, shoes, and stockings. That was that was the kind of the hit of the. I I have seen them myself. You know, they are surprised. Do you see anybody coming in shorts to office now? And basta? And the other symbol was the pipe pen. Pipe pen basta. Why? Why basta? And the best words you can hear from these guys is Yako. <laughs> they used to call these people Yako, Burwa, Gona. Can you do that now? And the bastam is to whack anybody sham. Chatta patta. Then pull out the grana. In 1979, eh? not so far away. But now, the engineers are well recognized in society. They are clean hands, we are perfume, we are very good mannerisms, and society looks up to them. Don't they? People look up to engineers, right? You can get a good dowry and a nice looking wife if you are an engineer, right? But do we live up to that? Do we live up to the expectation of the society? Incidentally, this Herbert Clark Hoover was the only engineer who went on to become a, the president of the United States of America. The Hoover Dam is built after him. Right. So definitions, who is an engineer? An engineer is a professional practitioner of engineering, concerned with applying scientific knowledge, mathematics and ingenuity, three ingredients. Without scientific knowledge, you can't be an engineer.
without mathematics you can't be an engineer without engineer you can't be an engineer right our language is science our words or the vocabulary is mathematics how many of you do that i have seen many engineers if you ask them any question they'll get an answer like this how can you answer this like that unless it's a routine question you are sometimes think analyze sometimes you may have to take the problem and back to the drawing board and start do some calculus then only you can come and answer right you have to use all your wisdom to come out with a solution to develop solutions for technical problems that's what we are for engineer design materials structures machines and systems while considering the limitations imposed by practicality safety and cost and i would add the words environmental considerations the word engineer is derived from the latin root ingenium meaning cleverness so you guys by birth are clever i would say by birth by your education and your experience you are clever we are all clever absolutely clever so don't forget that don't have any other complex right think is someone is better than you 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 are the best i am sure i show you some more pictures right engineers are grounded in applied science and their work in research and development is distinct from the basic research focus of scientists the work of engineers forms the link between the scientific discoveries and the applications that meet the needs of society right I asked for the weight of this bottle. What is the weight of this bottle? Huh? Half a kilogram. Anybody else? Uh, very good. Very good. I work in a place where I got a technical paper. It has already been accepted. by a very prestigious engineer university in this sri lanka and in that i saw a table which said about the moisture content of clay moisture content of clay it said 19 point 19 point 11 decimal places you don't believe it what is the use you are doctorate in engineering right i was mad a mad 11 decimal places and a percentage come on that's crazy i am so happy that you said it for a fantagram but for a scientist you ask him what the weight of this bottle is he will first analyze every constituent of this water every element in this plastic get the atomic number cut it to kilograms and he come up with maybe 503 point up to 10 decimal places does it have any meaning to us nothing but some, what I, why i am saying that is sometimes engineers tend to focus on things that are unimaginable when you put that something like that in a paper something something like that in a paper in a letter what does the reader expect uh, think of you he doesn't know what he is talking about it doesn't really matter to us whether you have uh, let's say in the concrete you have to pour let's say 10 meter cubes you put 10 meter cubes or 10.3 meter cubes or 20 point uh, to be regular side no it is good both there right as long as you can compact it okay 
So sometimes I see these things happening in the real field. I told you about a very classical case. And this prestigious university has even accepted this. And not in one place, right? Several tables had this level. So before curing this, after curing this, absolute nonsense. Right? So please be very careful of what, how you do approach practical problems that meet the needs of society. And if you are not prepared to meet the needs of society, engineering is not for you. I know several engineers who have done engineering for five, six years, given up their engineering career and gone to seclusion, wearing robes. I know one Christian priest and several Buddhist priests who are engineers. That's good. That's good for them. At least they will be doing something else, you know, useful for them. So therefore the central focus of engineering profession is the application of scientific knowledge to meet the societal needs. So it's that intersection. What does that uh, intersection look like? What does this uh, shape look like? What does it look like? Right? The center thing. That's only engineering, right? Nothing else. What does it look like? Anybody? Come on. What does it look like? Huh? Ellipso. That's a scientific uh, analysis. I mean, just a common man. If you show that to a common person and ask what does it look like, what will he say? The centerpiece. Huh? Anybody? Huh? Huh? Was it? Mouth, yeah. Eyes. Eyes. Right. Made of eyes. What is it? That's something unique. Something, something very, very uh, common thing. Doesn't it look like a paripuadi? What is paripuadi? Common man's food. Anybody likes paripuadi? So the engineers should be like that, like the Paripuani. You should be sought after people. People should seek after you, like the Paripuani. Api kohari ana kote Paripuani the kuch khanna tu inna the. Hamah handya khandya gaane mati inna the. That is our role. Paripuani role. Nothing more. Be the common man's food. That's our mission. But remember, we have our own traits. Right? On the other hand, engineers may pursue creativity, uh, may pursue creative efforts. Some of us are very creative. Without involving analytical skills. And one may apply analytical skills without entering the domain of creativity. So we as engineers, are very creative. God save us. <laughs> right? Atirani Jogulungi me Devo Vasatu Kale na Ekigilatu me Henagahana Tony Gila. Nani? <laughs> right? So we are very creative people, some of us. And some of us are very analytical. Remember, nothing is superior than the other, okay? That's a trait. I am not creative at all, you know. I mean, if you ask me to draw a picture, I can't. Right? That doesn't mean that I am an inferior guy. And some of us are very creative, and some of us are very analytical. That's our normal traits, right? So let's put engineering in this. For example, as engineers apply commercial software to solution of an engineering problem, the application of analytical skills per se may involve little or no creativity. Hey, what do you do? You just put some numbers into a model. You know what the numbers are. You get an answer, then look at those answers and try to weigh and see is this kind of uh, material available, is this kind of uh, quantities of concrete, is this kind of uh, cable sizes, 
available in this country. So after that we think, okay, that's analysis, right? And that's hardly really creative. On the other hand, an engineer may design an ergonomic office space with very little analytical skill. You know what ergonomics is? All of you know. What is it? Ah, right. Okay. Let me design for maximum comfort, efficiency, safety, and ease of use, especially in the workplace. Now, if you are an aircraft design engineer, and if you are designing the interior of an aircraft, well, in the space, right? You have to put in maybe. Uh, 150, 200 people in this aircraft, and sometimes 600, 700 now. Those huge, monstrous aircraft, right? And they are all managed within this aircraft. There are toilets. They are. Now oh, they have showers also in some of those aircraft. The food for the journey and everything, oxygen, water, everything. So. Designing an aircraft interior is something, you know, you may do all the analysis, but creative has to come in quite a lot. So let's look at, now look at engineering from these perspectives. So finally, engineers are classified into three categories. Those are highly analytical engineers, A, highly creative engineers, and engineers who are, have both creativity and analysis in them. We are all within those three categories. Three aspects of engineering. Sector A represents the intersection of purely analytical talents with engineering within the engineering domain. This may be used to represent the engineering science and ability to model complex systems and predict their response to various inputs under various conditions. That's what that's what we do, right? When you are trying to find solutions we use all kinds of permutations, all kinds of solutions with the material that we have in hand, we try to find a solution. The segment of engineering has of course been the subject of intense development for the last half century and has benefited most directly from the availability of fast digital computers. When I was a student, we had one, there were only three computers in the whole country. One was at State Engineering, one was at the of Piradini, one was at the of They called Katuba at the campus. Okay. The computer was about, uh, I think, about one tenth of this room. Eh? Big. The other printers and things were another plot. And we used to punch cards and write the program, code it, punch the cards and give this uh, pack of cards to the computer operator. We we'll take them in a rubber band, put them into the hopper and the uh, hopper will read all the cards, codify it and the next day you get the result. Next day you get the result. Now see the, how much the world has changed. I did my design for the undergraduate project using that computer. We designed, designed the transmission line. I still remember it's, uh, I think, Valachene uh, to Batikalo, Transmission Line, right? Very fun. But that kind of analysis we had done within seconds. So at Net Center, one chap was developing, I don't know if he has finished it. The finite element uh, model was here developing to uh, analyze the brick structures complex brick structures, the stresses and strains of each of the bricks. And that's a, when you go down, you can see this uh, Jeta Narami, I think. That's the tallest brick building in the whole world. Brick, clay brick. So I asked him, uh, how long it would have taken, how, how long it will take for you with your model to model all those, each brick, and come out with the solution. He said for two hours. You think how long it would have taken of 
forefathers and those engineers to build the Jetana maybe 40 years. Two couple of generations would have worked on Jetana, right? So that's how the engineering has evolved. And there's no going back. And that's pure analysis. Sector C, the intersection of our creative capacity with the engineering domain can be viewed as those sudden intuitive leaps often responsible for revolutionary advances in technology called significant novelty. As well as those aspects of engineering not yet fully supported by engineering science that remain more an art than a science. I'm sure you have, you are experienced people, you all have worked in problems. Sometimes you just can't find a solution. And you go home with that problem in your head and you sleep over it. Next day in the shower, you suddenly get this idea. Macha, I got it. And you are itching to come back to office and share your design with your colleagues, right? Where do you get that knowledge? Maybe your own creativity. The sector B, the intersection of knowledge and the need with both creative and analytical scaling can be used to represent the engineering design and much real world problem solving. So some of us, when you are young, you start off as pure analytical engineers or start with pure uh, creative engineers. And as we progress, that by now, you guys are merging all your skills and your experience to find solutions to real world problems. This sector includes activities ranging from develop, developing innovative products and processes, is where the innovation comes, to creating an innovative bridge design, to developing a new control process for petrochemical industry, and so on and so forth. I don't know how many of you have been to Japan. Ah, you have been to Japan, right? You know in Tokyo there's a, what is that river called? Tokyo. There's a river. Huh? Papagawa. Papagawa. Tamagawa. Tamagawa. How many bridges on that river? You have no idea. There are 39 bridges. 32 of 39 bridges. How do the bridges look like? All same? Trusses? like some of our bridges and they take a cruise uh, you can go on a cruise on this uh, river two hour cruise each bridge look completely different to the other bridge 39 bridges right but all of them carry the same load right and even now you see a lot of new buildings coming up, right? Uh, I was stunned to see uh, in, uh, I think it was a city, I can't remember, in China, the IBM building. Oh my God. It was just like a sea standing in from nowhere. Huge building, like a sea. Right? IBM building. So people come out with, now you see the crash tower or something and all kinds of nice, things, nice buildings are coming up, right? And when we were small, except for those buildings that were built by the Britishers, all the buildings were only like Pangedi, Achupam. Now people don't accept it anymore, right? They want some nice aesthetics around. The sector includes activities ranging from developing innovative products and you all are in the forefront. What about the other sectors in the above figure represent? Sector 1. Sector 1 is that analytical skills meeting societal needs. So the society and the engineers had to work with these people. Right? Sometimes we can't go to the society directly. <coughs> The intersection of ethical skills with societal needs outside the bounds of scientific knowledge might include economics and philosophy. Meet the needs of people with a lot of analysis. Who is the greatest 
philosophy in the world? No, no, Lord Buddha. Recently I saw about a nice quotation from Lord Buddha about, and he says, uh, everything is rel relative. So I wrote to my colleagues, and I saw that Einstein was two and a half thousand behind Lord Buddha, at least two thousand years behind Lord Buddha. He was speaking of relativity, right? So all because of his mind and analysis. So economics is also not an easy joke. Now we have got a set of jokers here, that's a different problem. That's why we have all these, we have all these problems, right? Economists, you go to other countries, the economists will manage the country in such a way that nobody feels that they are being threatened by the economists. And anything that we do here by the economists, everybody feels threatened. In other countries are much worse when it comes to taxing and all those things. In Canada, I was told that 35% of all the income is taxed. Right? But here, we have big problems, right? So analysis, where is this analysis? You saw recently, I mean, what, not so long ago, one finance minister comes and uh, really uh, takes off all the duty uh, for electric cars. It was maybe Mangala Samarina. You know. Then comes uh, Ravi Karunayaka, he reverses it next year. How can, what will happen to the people who invested on building electric cars? What is their plight? Where is this analysis? I don't mind calling them four or five letter words. Right? Sector 3 may en encompass us. You go down this uh, green path on a weekend. You see the amount of art that you see on the road? Why are they wasting the time? Time? No, they are wasting time. A lot of people come and buy those arts. Because we want art in our houses. We don't want our walls to be built blank. So we are, we like that. We need those people. Sector 2 may be used to represent those societal needs outside the bounds of scientific knowledge that requires both analytical skills and creative skills. Perhaps these are including public policy. I'm going to touch upon on public policy if there's time. Business administration. Now, public policy, not politics. Huh? Public policy is a complete different war game altogether. Business administration and music. Beethoven, Giovanni. I mean, they had to have their creativity and then analyze how to combine the notes the sharps and octaves and uh, flats in right, come on, so that it will be pleasing to the ear. And yes, cannot ignore the above very real issues in society. So we cannot look down and we cannot neglect these people. I hear a lot of rhetoric being talked about even by senior engineers saying we have to be interdisciplinary. Now, that's the key word, now, buzzword. Engineers can't be in their own cocoons. But when it comes to working with them, I have my region, I have this engineering. Huh? Don't come here. You have to work with these guys. Of course, engineers are superior, I must tell you that. If I don't tell you that, I'm, I'm committing a big sin. I'm being not honest. So engineers are creative problems always. Care for me? I wish I could. Right. Let me now get on to more technical words. Now the ABET or the Accreditation Board of USA uh, for Engineering and Technology is supposed to be the largest, largest, largest single entity looking after engineering in the whole world based in America. The Accreditation Board of Engineering and Technology of USA. They boast having activities and programs going, not 
365. All over the world. You are now there will be some training programs going on. You are now there will be, will be accrediting some engineering degrees. So I am sure they know what they are talking about. They call it that profession in which knowledge of mathematical and natural sciences gained by study, experience and practice is applied with judgment to develop both ways to utilize economically the materials and forces of nature for the benefit of man. And so every definition of engineering, you cannot escape few basic things, science, mathematics and needs, meeting the needs of society. If you are not ready to meet the needs of society for the benefit of mankind, even now it's not too late. As I told you, there are some people who have already gone to Rome. Do something worthwhile at least for you. You have to do all your work is for the benefit of man. The International Engineering Alliance. IES is a fully full signature of the IEA. And it's a full signature of the Washington Accord. I had the very good fortune as the past president of the IESL in 19, 2014 to go to Wellington when we got the Washington Accord full signatory status. I was the most fortunate person. The provisional signatory of the Sydney Accord and full signatory of the International Professional Engineers Agreement. Now, just now, before you all came, the boy came and got me to sign his IP <laughs> application. I'm, I don't know if you all saw that. A lot of people are now seeking to get the IP inch membership. They are heading out and can't help it. So these are the details of the IEA. So I will not, I will skip some of them. And this is the definition, what they say. Engineering is an activity that is essential in meeting the needs of people. Economic development is the most comprehensive uh, definition I ever seen. Economic development and the provision of services to society. Very clear. Engineering involves purposeful application of mathematical and natural sciences and a body of engineering knowledge. May I ask you where the body of engineering knowledge is? Anybody? Where is the body of engineering knowledge? You go down to the ground floor, the library is full of technical papers of 117 years. All of them are there over the last 116 years, 17 years now. All the technical papers are there. All the annual sessions. That is where the body of any knowledge is. Technology, techniques. Engineer seeks to produce solutions whose effects are predicted to the greatest degree possible in often uncertain contexts. So there is no guesswork, my dear friends. Recently in a uh, all engineers WhatsApp group, a very good friend of mine wrote the word, I guess, I guess, my guess is that next year the demand for electricity is going to be so much. I immediately shot back. A very good friend of mine. I said, engineers don't guess. Where we have all the wherewithal, all the data needed to make an estimate for the next year's electricity demand. You don't agree? Let me tell you a story. I was in charge of planning in CB for almost eight years. In 1992, we predicted that there will be a shortfall in 1996. That was your I remember 1996. That was the worst crisis we ever had before this. Where we had 11 to 13 years of, uh, 13 hours of forecast per day. 1996. And we had already predicted Either 680 or 650 gigawatt hours shortfall in generation. And immediately after the power cut, I got one of my young engineers. I have written his name also in that 
uh, group. His name is Ajit Ranahi. He is in uh, Glasgow, Scotland right now. A uh, very good uh, uh, goal ass. I got him to do a calculation to see how much we have in fact curtailed power in that year. So within 30 gigawatt hours. So who says as engineers we can't predict? All these rains are these are biophysical activities, right? And for millennia it has been repeating. How do we predict so well? Because we are taking 40 years of hydrological data. Let me tell you one more story. 2020, I was called by my colleagues in Dapakotpali, said, sir, sir, please come on 16th of April uh, before the country closed down. Uh, the Japanese ambassador had gone to uh, Nuerili and is now coming back. And he wants to stop over at Dapakotpali and he wants to have a uh, small presentation about the project. So they called me, gave me a couple of days, and I got them to make a presentation for me. If you want, I can show that to you, <laughs> right? I'm not really nice. And uh, I had the prediction of Apocotpura generation as 409 gigawatt hours per annum. Then from just 10 years, right? Around 8 years at the time. From 2012, I had the generation figure just listed down per year. So many gigawatt hours, so many gigawatt hours. He saw this 490 previous slide. Out of the blues, he asked me, what is average generation? I was shocked. I told one of the young boys to add up and take the average. On that particular day, the 410 gigawatt hours. I made this presentation at the 16th of September. You can see that uh, presentation. We were in the oration. Up to now, it's 415. So who says engineers can't do things? Who says engineers' uh, predictions are wrong? So when engineers speak, they speak with responsibility. They speak with data behind you. They speak with analysis behind you. Right? We can do things. Don't be disturbed. We can turn this country around. If you are around. If you are around. Right? Uh, technology and techniques. Every seeks to produce solutions whose effects are predicted to the greatest degree possible in often uncertain contexts. While bringing benefits, engineering activity has potential adverse consequences. We do have, uh, when we uh, I mean, build a road, a lot of noise being created, a lot of dust being created. People don't like it. But we need to do that. So therefore, we have to do the work responsibly and ethically. That's why we are going to be tested on ethics. Use available resources efficiently. Be economic. Safeguard health and safety. Be environmentally sound and sustainable. And generally manage risks throughout the entire life cycle of a system. The last one is something that I regret to tell you. In most cases, the engineers forget to do risk analysis. When you do projects, you have to do constant risk analysis, risk management. It's not frivolous. There are a lot of theories behind risk management. How to tackle risks, how to predict risks, how to mitigate risks. So engineering has a lot more than what you and I think. So I'll just skip these things because these are too many slides and you may be already bored, right? Coming to the Engineering Council. We have an Engineering Council established in Sri Lanka. I'm going to say a few words on that. And they talk of three categories of engineers. Engineers, uh, incorporate engineers and engineer technicians. We always forget that we think engineers are only the chartered engineers and the professional engineers. All international literature talk of engineering practitioners, not of engineers. Not engineers. They talk of engineering practitioners. 
And in that category, there are three categories of practitioners. Engineers, technologists, who are called incorporated engineers. I skip those slides, please. Anybody wants these slides, I can send it, right? Engineering technicians. All these three categories are important, my dear friends. And very often engineers forget to give due respect to the skills and the knowledge set that the incorporated engineers or the tech, engineering technologists possess and also the engineering technicians. How much I have learned when I was on training. Nowadays, most of the training is just on the surface, right? If you come, I can show you where I have got cuts on my knuckles. So I was working at a, at a shop in uh, down Dali Road. It's just called Walker and Greg. That company is no more there. So it is a bronze company, right? And there they had a welding shop. And those days we learned welding from Basu Nehes who came in Saron and Baniyama, Ulakkhave. They didn't have uh, wire brushes those days. And you know, the, there are many, you can get this, you know, if you want to do a good weld, the best thing you have, first thing you have to do is to prepare the material. And most of the uh, farm machinery used to, I mean, like trucks, the trailers, used to come there with mud. And there were no wire brushes, only pollen. We used pollen. <laughs> to clean those trailers and I did welding under those buses. I got cuts all over. I will never forget this. So the technicians also have the skill that we lack. So we have to respect their skills. We have to get their support for our work. Don't look down on them. So engineer technicians are concerned with applying proven techniques and procedures to solution of practical engineering problems. The lowest category of uh, engineer practitioners. They call they are called engineering practitioners, man. In the international jargon. They carry supervisory or technical responsibility and are competent to exercise creative aptitudes and skills within the defined fields of technology. Learn to respect them. Professional engineering technicians contribute to the design development. They can come and tell you, Matya, Omakarani Papi, Tatadala Vedakaranave. Who else will tell you? Technicians. Design development. Origin. Who is there? Technicians. Engineering practitioners. We forget them. Engineering technicians contribute to design, development, manufacture, commissioning, decommissioning, operation or maintenance of products, equipment, processes or services. Incorporate engineers or the technologists, as they, as the IEA calls them, technologists, engineering technologists. They maintain and manage applications of current and developing technology, and may undertake engineering design, development, manufacture, construction, and operation. Incorporated engineers are variously engaged in technical and commercial management, and process, process effective interpersonal, and should possess effective interpersonal skills because they are managing teams of technicians. So we need the technologists in this country. There are debate recently at the ISL AGM if you all came. And so even about a couple of days ago here in this same auditorium. Now there is a big threat to the engineering profession. Why? The engineering technology stream has commenced. And they are asking, our members are asking. Will they come and get our jobs? No. They have a specific role. This is the role. If you go to India, for one engineer, they have about 10 incorporated engineers, technologists. They call them incorporated engineers. They call them engineers. Of course, they know. Well, I have gone and I didn't know that he was not a fully qualified engineer. I asked him to do certain things. He said, sir, you have to ask for my engineer. 
they know where their limitations are. The problem in Sri Lanka is we take everyone as a competitor. They should know what they are supposed to be doing. We should know what we are supposed to be doing. If we do the other, of course, there's no one, no, no difference. So as engineers, we must know what our role is. That's why I kept on giving you all those definitions. Go home and study. Right? Technology should know this is where they stand. Thus far and no more. But our people are feeling threatened now. By technological stream, people are coming now. There was a question right here. On the 19th of January. It was here. The discussion came place. Took place here. This auditorium. Nobody could get an answer. I of course said something along these lines. Chartered engineers are the chart, what you are going to get. Uh, I, I put all the engineers here in this category. Are characterized by their ability to develop appropriate solutions to engineering problems. Using new or existing technologies through innovation, creativity and change. This is what you are supposed to be doing. Every problem, don't take it as a routine, there's a routine solution. No! Try to do something better. I tell all my young engineers, don't just do what I am doing. Question me why I am doing this as any engineer. Then you will come out with a better solution. Train your engineers, young engineers, to do that. Right? Because they will come out with new technologies, new techniques, promote advanced designs and design methods, introduce new and more efficient production techniques, marketing and that's what you are supposed to be doing. Marketing and construction concepts. Marketing is part of engineering. Or pioneer new engineering services and management methods. Chartered engineers are variously engaged in technical and commercial leadership and possess effective interpersonal skills. If you want to take home a message, this is the message for today. So I will skip some of these things because time has caught up. All these things are there. It's a folder of theory. So what do we need our engineers to be? Listen with an open mind and speak up when required. First listen, then speak. Always be in a talking mood, not chattering mood, but uh, making statements. Does not Russian words, but please speak sense. Write well, clear and logical writing. Clear and logical writing. In whatever they write, fiercely careful about accuracy. Fiercely careful about there's no chance for you to make an error. That's why you are guys are going to be very responsible people. Good manners, courteous and well mannered. Dress well. Be smartly dressed to suit the occasion. Of course, I won't tell you to go smartly dressed like me when you're going for a party. I'll be mad. If I do that, read well. Such a lot of media, social channels, uh, news channels, journals, technical reports. I have always told my young engineers 50% of your time you have to devote for reading. When I say reading, it's not textbooks or anything. Even the letters that come to your table, read every word. They are important. Somebody is trying to convey a meaning to you. When you write, you have to also write the letters with a lot of caution. Let me tell you a story. I am doing a lot of projects, right? There was a huge project. And the contractor was trying to escape. After getting the award in the, award in the contract, he little realized they all trapped him. 
into the contract. How do I do that? You know, we have a system called common law in this country. The common law says, commercial common law, right? Commercial law. You make an offer. You call for tenders, right? All of you call for tenders. You make an offer. Why do you make an offer? Because you can do it. What is the price? The price is there. Everything is written now. I asked you to do something. You tell me how much you want to do that job. And you tell me how you are going to do that job. I tender. You make offer. The moment I accept the offer. And send the letter of acceptance. The contract is established. Never put the words. Some people make this mistake of saying, right, you come for negotiation and we'll sign the contract then. No, never say that we are going to sign the contract. We write, we say, until we finalize through a negotiation process or whatever, this letter of offer, acceptance, binds, uh, forms a contract. Well, read some of those uh, letters of acceptance. Well, read some letters of acceptance. So it was written. And this guy, after the negotiation, about to run away. I said, nothing doing. You have already established the contract. You are legally bound to do this work at this price. He's caught. Be careful when you're writing letters. Every word counts. So for you to do that, you have to read well. Read a lot of contracts. Read specifications. Work hard. Are you ready to face challenge? Yes or no? Yes. This is what you said. That you said yes. This is what you said. That you are the young boy in the red shorts. It's not a joke. Huh? It's not a joke. That's your responsibility. But there are two things to remember. Face the challenge confidently. Think confidently, thinking, if I can't, who can do the job? If I can't, who can do this job? That's why I have got this job. I went for an interview, I got this job, and I have got a contract with my superior, my company. Why? They thought that I'm, I can do the job. So I must do the job. No looking back. And after winning, be humble enough to say, humble enough to say, be humble enough to say, if I can, who can't? That after you do the job, you train others. I have done it. So it's my responsibility to make sure others also can do the job. So be very careful. You have a responsibility. Now look at all these awful pictures. Who is responsible for this? Don't put the blame on anybody. Electrical short circuit. Every electrical engine you would have got in all is responsible. Don't try to put the blame on this, that and the other. Who is responsible for this in Sri Lanka? Any idea? Who is responsible for this? Who? Absolutely. I hear sometimes, I have been showing this, I hear some people saying, uh, uh, I hear people saying civil engineers. No, the civil engineer who decided this would have been buried 50 years ago. The local authorities in the Kalama municipality did not warn these people that this building is not safe for you to work. Dhaka, the worst, one of the worst engine disasters. Now, one thing. I don't know how if I've been to uh, and also with the uh, Bengalis, Bangladesh. One thing I'll tell you, 
just any other race in on earth sri lankans are like twins of bangladeshis if you go there you see a lot of people just like you he make balance i was studying like him you know i mean overseas for a couple of years i could even tell between the chinese and japanese chinese and koreans after some time you can figure out the way they walk the way they talk even the indians within the some states you can say is from karnataka is from uh, the tamil nadu is from uh, uh, north india but one kind of people you could never say apart from sri lankans was the bengalis until this week even the way they walk is like sri lankans you believe me i don't know whether you have experienced that kind of thing if you have worked with any bengalis they look identical so ape we show you that okay una mas see the has kaane gila balan inna there was a funny joke on the weekend papers so about this because uh, chinese project in china what is this where is this my dear friends can anyone guess where this place is of course in sri lanka right in fact one day i i know this is the same bridge no it, i i i was riding on a bridge in uh, kotpal area i was doing this up kotpal project half way through this bridge the bridge starts swaying like this there are four of us so two of us got uh, came from behind two of us walked in front and we were guiding the driver to come very slowly the bridge was doing like this and there were several of my batchmates in dardi the first thing i came out and i my my heart was pumping like anything right i started blagging all my friends in the rd i said can't to at least put a notice they don't go on this bridge how irresponsible are you can be if technologists and technicians try to do the job of engineers those things can happen what i showed so don't allow them to do their job our job you do our we do our job and let them do their job but are we prepared to face challenge can we confidently say that we engineers in sri lanka will not let all these kind of things happen can i sell assure that chartered engineers are in a position to avoid this kind of disasters the answer is in your hand so i in the council a couple of slides and public policy i just take care of public policy i stop it thomas die is a a uh, philosopher on political science favor said public policy is whatever a government chooses to do or even not to do other than the actual laws of the land laws are laid down the public policy is not sometimes very clear there's also public policy that governs the nature so this public policy and we had to educate the public policy and that's as i said before is not in the hands of the politicians alone so what is public policy public policy is said to be a combination of laws regulations actions policies and any other factors concerning a given topic such public policies of a nation are shaped over time by education advocacy groups aragale influences of lobbyists and conflicting interests of special interest groups so be very careful as managers not to sometimes get trapped into people who are pushing something advocacy groups right they'll come and give you nice rosy pictures these the best thing to buy and you know be careful are we committing something that we cannot maintain the public policy process is therefore a very dynamic and a complicated process that occurs via public forums so you have to get engaged in public forums first the problems of the public receive recognition and identification then the process of public policy will help sort out problems 
So don't allow the public policy be shaped by politicians alone. They of course play a role. The policies can be political, economic, cultural and social in nature. So let's take some examples. Say for example, a fine for traffic violence used to be very lenient in this country. The statistics show that eight, daily eight, now today the rates are about 10 to 12 lives are lost every day in this country due to road accidents. Recently the government, you know, the, raised, they raised the, the, the fines. There is no law for that. It's a public policy that they raise the law uh, rates. I'm sure it's for the politicians. I'm sure the most of the officers got involved in raising those rates. However, they are still not quite as strict as in other in, in U Europe, USA or Singapore. This can be considered as an evolution of public policies of the nation. Promulgation of regulations under the Quarantine Act of Sri Lanka. We sound after about 150 years, our act was not sufficient to deal with the COVID. So they brought in act, I don't know if this is still passed it. Right? They were still, well, what? That's why some of you hear some people saying all what the government did was not legal. What's not legal? They would have taken them to courts. And in certain countries that happened. Right? In certain states in the USA, it's terrible. So I will not go into all these details. So, yeah, I'll stop at this. Okay, last one. Sorry. So I think I. It's the last slide. There's a nice picture in that. I'll just show that. So, friends, if you want, I'll give my email letter. Send me an email. I'll send this. So, this is what you're going to do. You said you're ready. You accepted the challenge. Don't think you are a small guy. The world out there is not small enough for you. Right? It's not big enough for you. So conquer them. Okay. I think I discussed enough. I closed almost on time. If you have any questions, you can ask me. So if you want, uh, just send me an email. Uh, my email is simple, shavindranath, s-h-a-v-i-n-d-r-a-n-a-t-h, at gmail.com. So if I can send this slide to you. Shavindranath, s-h-a-v-i-n-d-r-a-n-a-t-h, at gmail.com. Okay, if you have no questions. You agree with all what I said, or just don't agree? <laughs> so, yes. uh, about the public policies, yeah. so sometimes we cannot go against public policies because uh, they, they, they hold it, like the treasury work for that policy, but we cannot spend the money to go against or to correct it. What can we do in that case? Special transport policy. Easy chaos, right? And I know it first hand because when I joined CEB and in 1983 I was all doing demand analysis. Right? So we are running some models to go forecast the uh, energy generation. In 1983 we had a demand called railway electrification. What are we doing now? After how many years? 40 years. No railway degree. We are talking. But still have we stopped? No. In 2008, we lobbied here in the IES and in this institution. We got down the IEI, Institute of Engineers India, to send experts to Sri Lanka. And we produced a document 
entire relationship again started happening. That is what is being discussed even now. <coughs> again, what happened? Obstacle. Obstacle. I do agree with you. It's not actually public policy not to do electrification. I don't think there's any public policy that you can't improve the transport system. So that public policy is facilitating, but we have to all collectively get together and work for it. <coughs> right? In our own way, we have to, at every point, we have to do the right thing. That's all I'm saying. Anything else? I wish that there were a lot more people to interact so that there would have been more ideas coming up. Sorry, it's okay. What to do? Okay, good night.